Good morning, everyone. Welcome to HR Issues in the Time of COVID-19 webinar. This webinar is sponsored by the SUI Library Systems, which includes Arrowhead, Bridges, Kenosha County, Lakeshores, Milwaukee County, and Monarch Library Systems. I'm Laurie Freund with the Bridges Library System, and joining me as co-host this morning is Angela Myers, also with Bridges Library System. Just a few items before we begin. Your microphone and webcam are not needed and will not be used during the webinar. We have gathered questions submitted by registrants to gear this presentation to your needs. However, if you have a question, you can click or tap on the Q&A icon on your Zoom toolbar and type in your question. Our presenter will answer those questions at the end of his presentation. Please take a moment and find that Q&A feature. If you are logged in on a computer, you will usually find the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. If you are on a tablet or phone, you may find the Q&A icon at the top of the screen. So now let's begin our program by introducing today's speaker. Attorney Jeffrey Trotier is advises on a variety of employment and human resource issues, including policy and contract drafting, dispute resolution, defense of claims, and various day-to-day -day matters. He has spoken at various library workshops and conferences in Wisconsin. Mr. Tortiard is joining us today to talk about human resource issues facing library administrators and managers during this ongoing pandemic. Based on all the questions that were submitted by registrants, and there were over 100 of those questions, he has been able to prepare this presentation to gear it to your needs. So welcome, Jeff, I'll let you begin. Good morning, thank you, Lori. Thank you, Angela. I think it was appropriate that I'm not sure if your video caught that, but in the time of COVID waiting to speak, I had a big sneezing attack if you saw that. So I assure you it is hay fever and nothing worse than that. So today we're talking about HR issues in the time of COVID. Um, today's agenda, we're going to address mask requirements, uh, paid leave, remote work, best practices for return to work, testing considerations, and how to address hiring during a pandemic, furlough, and layoff issues. As Lori said, we've got a lot of great questions. So I've streamlined content so we have more question time and less time of me just repeating what you likely already are familiar with. Um, I do ask that if you have additional questions, we can hold those to the end. You can type them into the question and answer bar and we will address them as we have time at the end. Um, and with that, I did want to just move right into the mask requirements. This is an ever-changing area of the law. And quite frankly, just about everything involving the pandemic has been ever-changing. We've had um, moments where we've gotten Department of Labor guidance, and then we've had an act that was issued by Congress and then Congress has told the DOL to then issue regulations. The DOL issues regulations, then Congress tells the DOL, no, you got it totally wrong. So then the DOL has to walk it back. Then the Congress amends what they've just issued, and then the DOL issues guidance and then regulations. This happens. So you have basically a radical change in the law every two or three days. So we appreciate everything that employers and government, local governments have done to be so flexible and dynamic in this time period. And that brings us right to mask requirements, something that probably will be frequently changing. As most people know, last week we received executive order 84 from Governor Evers, which also included emergency order number one, which is our title for this slide, EMO number one, which that is the emergency order which has required masks or face coverings as it's referred to in the EMO. Um, first of all, what counts as a face covering? Um, they very specifically define this as a bandana, a cloth face mask, a disposable paper face mask, a neck gaiter, which is, you've probably seen people wear them. They're basically like um, those, they look like a turtleneck, but only the turtleneck part that they then pull over their face. And then religious face coverings. Those are all acceptable face coverings under the emergency order. A face shield is not an acceptable covering, and the CDC has been 
uh, very clear that face shields are nowhere near as effective as a mask. A mesh mask or any mask that has holes, openings, or other vents will not be an acceptable face covering under the emergency order. So these face coverings must be worn indoors at all times unless you're in a private home or unless you're alone in a closed room. Um, right now I'm in my office um, at work, but my door is shut so I can wear or I don't need to wear a mask. As soon as I walk out that door, that mask has to be on. Um, outdoors, if you're going to be within six feet of people, you need to wear a mask. Otherwise, um, otherwise you are violating the emergency order and you can be fined. The, the fine is $200 per person per violation. Um, and it's the individuals who will be fined, unlike Milwaukee's uh, mask requirement where the businesses or the facility owner would be fined, now it's the individuals who will be fined. Um, if you are on a break at work and you're eating, or if you're in a restaurant and eating, anywhere you're eating or drinking, then you can take the mask off, but you should still be six feet away from people. Um, in the event OSHA finds that there is some kind of risk with you performing your job and wearing a mask, then you won't have to wear a mask. We're seeing this come up. This risk mainly happens where the mask would fog up safety goggles or your welding shield or something like that. But unless there is a statement from OSHA that you should not be wearing a mask, a mask will be required no matter what you're doing at work. Um, the next bullet point is medical conditions. If you have a medical condition where you um, cannot wear a mask, then you don't have to wear a mask. Now, how do we address that? For libraries, you are in a very interesting position where you're both a public accommodation and you're an employer. We have different rules for public accommodations and different rules for employers and how we handle these things. Um, there is a lot of overlap, so your Venn diagram looks kind of like this. Um, but we can, if we put policies in place, we can require more information for employees. As a public accommodation, if someone says I have a medical condition and I can't wear a mask, then you just have to take them at their word. As an employer, you can put a policy in place saying we require masks. Then if someone says I have a medical condition where I can't wear a mask, then you go through the interactive process under the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Wisconsin Fair Employment Act, which is our state version of the ADA. And we then uh, will ask them for medical certification. So they must provide documentation from their physician or healthcare provider saying why they cannot wear a mask. And then you can look at reasonable accommodations. Maybe the accommodation isn't not wearing a mask. Maybe the accommodation is moving their workstation, putting them near ventilation or having them work remotely. So you go through that accommodation process with an employee if you put a policy in place. Um, who has to provide the masks? The masks need to be provided by the employees or by the patrons of the library, whoever is coming into the public accommodation. If it's someone going to a grocery store, although a lot of grocery stores are providing masks, it really is the obligation of the individual coming in to use those services. So it is not your obligation to provide those masks. Um, speaking of dynamic and changing a lot, as I said, this emergency order went into effect this last Saturday. So this is really our first work week dealing with it. However, We've already heard from several Republican legislators who have said that they are going to be introducing some kind of legislation that would maybe dilute, maybe completely countermand the emergency order. For now, this is the law, but it's something where we always have to stay tuned. Okay, let's hit your many, many questions about masks, and they were all really great questions. Um, what is the current legal perspective of face coverings or masks? I think I addressed that. 
Um, and if you have additional questions after the end of this, we will go through that. Can we require people to wear masks or only request it? It's required for now. It is an emergency order from the governor. It does have the force of law until it's countermanded by something else. So if someone comes to your facility and says, I'm coming in without a mask, I don't have a medical reason for that. I'm just coming in. You can tell them, no, you must stay out. Um, that is the law. If staff members are uncomfortable with face masks, can they substitute with a face shield? No. If it's just uncomfortable, then we're not talking about a medical issue. Um, and a face shield would never be a sufficient substitute anyway under the emergency order, as I mentioned. Face shields are not included. We also received some guidance from the state of Wisconsin, and they said that face shields will not be considered an adequate face covering. Also, looking just at CDC guidance, they've been clear that face shields don't do a whole lot. Masks are really what you need to be wearing. Um, my board is going to revisit a mask mandate. How do I handle a staff person who is inconsistent about wearing a mask? Well, discipline. You can tell the employee that they will receive a verbal warning or a written warning or they'll be suspended or they'll be sent home. Any level of discipline is fine for not wearing a mask. They're breaking the law. They're breaking it. They're it being insubordinate in that they are ignoring your directive. If you do have a policy in place, which I do recommend, um, they're also violating a policy, subjecting themselves to discipline. Um, the next one, what are positive, kind ways to encourage mask use by the public? I thought this is a really good question and very, a very constructive one. Um, I like to recommend that you, first of all, point out who the affected, affected populations are. Yes, we are all affected by the pandemic, but there are certain populations that are at greater risk those populations are always shifting as well. It's likely that some of those populations are heavier users of in-person library services, and you can point that out. You can say that these, uh, for example, I think that people in the 70 to 90 bracket or the 80 to 90 bracket are the second highest population. They may be or more, most at risk, they may be more likely to be using your in-service or in-person facility services. So point that out. Say, this is who's coming here. This is who's at risk. We need to protect them. Um, you're helping protect others. You may want to post statistics around the library as to why you are enforcing this. I also like to point to um, CDC statistics about how many cases could have been protected had we been wearing masks from the beginning? Um, one statistic I've heard a lot, um, I have a sister-in-law who used to work for the CDC, and she mentioned that 80 to 85% of all cases could have been prevented if we were wearing masks from, say, March on. So point that out. Without a masking mandate, what is the best way to impose a strongly to encourage you to wear masks recommendation? Well, the great thing is you can regulate your own space. The library is your space. Library directors control that space. Yes, they are. They do answer to their board to an extent, but just like requiring shoes, shirts, things like that, you can require people to wear a mask, but you can impose reasonable um, clothing requirements or clothing bans. Some um, spaces have said no, oh, no inflammatory clothing, no inflammatory t-shirts, or in more urban settings we find public accommodations that do state no, say, gang signs or symbols that would be associated with something that's going to cause issues. So we have a long history of being able to regulate the public accommodation that way and regulate your workspace. 
both for the employee and the public. It is better, again, to have a policy in writing. How can we make accommodations for those who can't wear masks? Um, you will know your space better than I will, but just think about my experience with libraries, um, providing hand sanitizer, providing curbside services. Um, most libraries have reading rooms or study rooms. You can designate those for people who can't mask or you can designate certain ones for people who can't mask. You can make sure that you have high efficiency air filters or HEPA filters installed. Um, have designated carols for use, block off every second or third carol. So you are enforcing social distancing that way. Block off various study tables that are publicly set out in your space so that people know not to sit there. So you are enforcing some kind of social distancing. Um, and of course, make sure that these spaces get cleaned after use constantly. So always do a nightly deep clean. If someone has a carol or a study room checked out, make sure that there is sanitization done after they have turned in the key. Make sure the keys, of course, are sanitized as well. Um, if masks are required, must the library supply the masks to the patron? No. So it's always a good idea to have a few on hand, but it is their responsibility. If they show up without a mask, you can tell them, go back to your car, go back to your home, get a mask. How do we enforce mask compliance? Uh, just old fashioned monitoring. If you see someone come in without a mask, you have to let them know. They must go out, get their mask, come back in. Um, and then if you do have a policy, you can point to the policy. If you have a policy, I would post the policy. If you have an ordinance, post the ordinance. If you have a board resolution, post that. Whatever authority you have, make it clear. So you can just put your arm out and point on the wall. This is our clear requirement. Do employees need the okay from a doctor to see if they are able to wear a mask? No, they do not. Um, this is a really good question because under OSHA, you do have to do what's called fit testing for certain types of personal protective equipment. That usually is for respirators, things where the seal is very important for, to make sure that it's effective. You do not have to do that for just a cloth or paper mask or a bandana. What should we say to our workers that won't wear a mask? don't sanitize their hands between tasks and or don't social distance. Again, you discipline them. You tell them that this is part of your job. This is a job requirement. If you don't do this, it's insubordination. It will subject you to a write-up, whether it's a verbal warning, a written warning, suspension, something leading to termination. That's fine. Um, if you have a law in place like we do for now, that's great. You can point to that. But it is, again, better to have a policy in place. That's gonna be my mantra for the day is, what do your policies say? Um, even if the law only goes so far, your policies can go farther. You can be more restrictive in your policies. That's fine, unless the law prohibits that. Right now, we have um, a fairly restrictive emergency order. If that gets locked back by either the governor's office or by the legislature, Unless the legislature says you can't prohibit something, you can still be more restrictive. That's fine. We've had a lot of questions about what leave is available under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which you'll hear me refer to as the FFCRA. There are two leave laws actually available under the FFCRA. The Employee Paid Sick Leave Act, which is the EPSLA, E-P-S-L-A, yes, I always have to check my word, my letters on that. And then the um, FMLA Expansion Act. So we will talk about the E-P-S-L-A first. This applies to all employers who, are, who have less than 500 employees. There's something called the small business exemption. Basically, that states that you may be exempt 
if it's too onerous and too expensive. That is unlikely to apply to a library system to the extent a library system is going to be considered a joint employer with the municipality or municipalities that it's attached to. So it's very unlikely that you would be able to make use of the small business exemption for this leave because regardless of the logic here, courts generally take the viewpoint that anything that's attached to government, state, local, or federal, has deep pockets, has the ability to fund these things. So even if you have a very limited budget given to you by that government, they will still look at this as flowing through to the underlying government body. And that's why we call you an integrated or a joint employer with that government body. The EPS LA provides leave for an employee's COVID-19 related illness. So if they are symptomatic, if they have a positive test result, if they are under medically ordered quarantine, if they're awaiting test results, if that test was ordered by a doctor, or if they're under a government isolation order. Um, an employee who is taking a leave for their own illness can get up to 10 days of pay, full pay capped at $511 per day. If it's a part-time employee, they still are eligible. It just will be prorated. And this is available to any employee who has worked for you for 30 days or more. There is also leave under the EPSLA to care for the family member's COVID-19 related illness. So if you have to take care of a family member who is sick with, with um, COVID and has been quarantined, they will get the lesser of either two thirds of their regular pay or $200 per day. For either of these leaves, the employee has to be unable to telework or remotely work. So if they can work remotely, then they don't get the leave, they should just be working remotely. You can require them not to substitute pay time off, but to augment any partial leave with pay time off. So if the employee is only getting two thirds of their pay, they can then take one third PTO for each day to bring that amount up. Intermittent leave is not available under the Employee Paid Sick Leave Act. So you can only take it in full blocks. You can't take it half a day here, half a day there, just big chunks, and it's a maximum of 10 days. You don't get this leave unless you provide medical documentation. If it's um, for the employee's leave themselves, you need a note from the doctor stating that they, have, they are out because they're quarantined for symptoms, that the doctor is ordered to test and a note from the doctor when they are going to be available to come back to work. If it's for the, to take care of the employee's family member, you still need a note from the doctor who is caring for that employee, employee family member stating that they are symptomatic. They have a positive COVID test. They're waiting for COVID. Um, And if they want this paid leave, they must give you this documentation. We've, for our clients, we've developed documentation that really, it's a form that piggybacks off of family and medical leave documentation. So we found that to be very useful and the DOL has approved of those forms. The FMLA Expansion Act. This is what we refer to as the Child Care Act. So for employees who can't come to work because their child's school is closed, their child's daycare is closed during the summer if their normal activities or day camp or other camp has been closed because of COVID and the parent has to stay home, this leave is available as well. Again, this applies to employers with less than 500 employees for all employees who have worked for 30 days or more and who have had an inability to telework so they can't work remotely, they can get, well, it's 12 weeks of childcare leave. It's really 10. The first two weeks, they get that leave under 
the Employee Paid Sick Leave Act. Then you move over to this week, weeks three, three, sorry, three through 12 are then covered. They get the lesser of two thirds pay or 200 bucks a day. If there is another caregiver available, whether it's a spouse or an adult sibling or a grandparent, then they're not eligible for this leave. They can substitute PTO to bring that two thirds up to full pay, and you can require that as well. They can do this intermittently, and you can require documentation of this. So certify that there is no school. Uh, for part-time leave, it will, or part-time employees, it will be prorated as well. I think I've talked about the verification. Leave questions. Okay, here are your gr really great questions. Uh, first question I hopefully did cover, um, whether it was briefly or not, I leave that up to your judgment. Can FMLA work for villages with less than 50 employees? Um, it's very rare, rare that you find a village that has less than 50 employees when you aggregate everyone together. But if you don't have 50 employees, then um, you're not covered under the FMLA, but you are covered on the, under the FMLA Expansion Act, what we just talked about, and the Employee Paid Sick Leave Act. So even if you don't have 50 employees, you still are subject to those unless you have 500 employees. Um, do we have an obligation to allow remote work if the request is to the benefit of the staff due to childcare? Um, if they can work remotely, first of all, it's a great idea. We are seeing a lot of employers who are being very creative about how to set up remote work. If they can't work remotely, then they do have a right to this paid leave. I think that we're gonna see a big change in workplaces um, once, the, once we're able to manage the pan pandemic better. A lot of workplaces that have been typical show your face, FaceTime workplaces are going to be primarily remote because we are discovering we can do this. So if you can provide remote work, I do recommend it. Um, are there any special considerations for staff taking a non-medical leave of absence in order to homeschool? Um, well, your leave program is what your leave program is. You can structure your leave program whatever way you want. If they are taking time off to homeschool, they do have the ability to take this leave under the employee or the FMLA Expansion Act. Beyond that, no. Um, if you have a leave program that does provide for them to take an unspecified leave that goes beyond that 12 weeks, make sure you have a written policy and you have a written agreement. Make sure it applies to everyone so you have a neutral policy that you apply even handedly to everyone because we don't want a discrimination claim to come out of this. Um, consider whether this employee who wants to take off full time could actually do part-time remote work. Is there something, some part of their job that they could do in the evenings when they're not homeschooling? Um, make sure that any leave is for a set time period. Touch base with them while they're out. Also be clear whether you're providing job protected leave or not. Are you going to continue to provide employer paid portions of benefits while they're out? Think through these issues, what you're really willing to provide or is this really effectively they're quitting, but they have the right to reapply and you would consider rehiring them? And have that candid conversation. Whatever you do, please memorialize this in writing and make sure you apply it evenly to everyone. Are libraries, are libraries paying staff members when they are out awaiting COVID-19 results? If it's a doctor recommended or doctor ordered test, then they do have the eligibility for paid leave under the EPSLA. Um, the trend among library practices, I don't, I can't speak to. I know several private sector employment clients of mine have done that, but that's, that's discretionary. 
Uh, how do we handle an older staff person whose family has health issues and just doesn't feel safe coming back to work? If they don't feel safe coming back to work, that's their decision. They aren't eligible for any paid leave under those circumstances. If you can accommodate that, that's great. You're not obligated to do so. If you want to do that, though, I would suggest having a written voluntary furlough with them so that they, you have in writing that they're the ones requesting this leave. Here's why they're requesting the leave. This is a date by which they will check back with you and let you know whether they're going to come back or whether they want to have further conversations. So put in writing that that obligation is on their desk. Can employees work from home if they need to quarantine for 14 days due to um, exposure? Yes, please. Like you've heard me say, I think remote work is a great idea. It keeps them working, it keeps them engaged, it keeps them having an income stream, and it, keeps, it helps you to get the job done. So definitely, please do consider whether that is possible. Um, one consideration is what kind of equipment they will need to work remotely. This day and age, most people do have internet and have their own laptop or desktop at home. I think it's okay to require them to at least have their own internet. You may want to provide them with a laptop to take home, be very clear and have a written agreement that that laptop is library property. They're not to install anything. They're not to use it for personal use. It is only for business or for or library use. Um, put that in writing and that they agree to return it by a certain time. Uh, will part-time employees that get COVID-19 be on leave with no pay? Um, part-time employees, if they've been employed by you for at least 30 days, will be eligible for prorated leave prorated pay, rather, under the Employee Paid Sick Leave Act. How do we make accommodations for employees who do not feel comfortable in the workplace? Again, remote work. You could provide alternating shifts or split shifts. So if you have three people in one position, they alternate days, or they each work two or three hours a day so that they each are having some work on the premises, but you are limiting your population. Um, have them wear masks. Provide, make it clear that you are having your maintenance go through a daily deep clean of everything. And that's really the extent of what you can do unless you want to offer them discretionary leave. It wouldn't be paid leave unless you, of course, can make that work, but it, you wouldn't be required to provide paid leave. Can I work at home until I feel more comfortable returning to work? Well, I think that's based on what, what's employ, what does the employer's need? Do you need them there? Can they work remotely? But if it's just a comfort level, again, they don't have a right to do this. If you can accommodate it, great. Is working from home during the pandemic versus not a benefit that can create an unfair work environment in a small town? Um, well, perception is different than the law. And so while I can't speak to perception and the optics of that particular environment, again, I do think that the pandemic is changing how we work from home and how we approach the workplace. Remote is now the norm. Um, it will be a challenge to bring remote workers back to the workplace once we have a handle on the pandemic because they've realized I don't necessarily need to be there every day. Um, but as far as creating an unfair work environment, as long as you have a neutral policy that you are applying even handedly to everyone, preferably again in writing. If you were all in person, I would make you say in writing with me, because I feel that strongly about it. Um, then that should go as far as you possibly can to managing other people's expectations and the optics of the situation. If the library is open for limited hours, is it still okay to have staff telework some hours or must all work be in the library? 
Again, if you can work remotely, you definitely should. They can definitely telework as long as you have enough people there in person to handle what needs to be done. What you also could consider is a second shift for things like shelving or repair or check-in of books. Does that really need to happen with your full staff? Can maybe one or two pages or circulation employees handle that in the evening, um, spread out from each other? So think about creative scheduling. Okay, should we have a telecommute agreement with employees who are still working from home? Yes. Yes, please have, a, have an agreement, have it in writing, at least have a policy. Um, have them agree that equipment is only for work. Have them agree that they will be limited to certain hours. Have them agree that policies still apply and that the workday is only while they are working. When you work remotely, it's great. You log in, you do something, then maybe you do the dishes, you throw the laundry in, you mow the lawn, then you go back to work. Maybe you make lunch, then you go back to work. There are these gaps throughout the day. If you have a non-exempt, so an hourly employee, require them to log all of their time so that all of their breaks are accounted for. If you have an outside payroll provider like Paylocity, Paychex, ADP, a lot of them will provide software that will help you do this very easily or an app on their phone. How long can we allow employees to work remotely before it becomes an issue? Um, I'm not sure what becomes an issue really means, except for creating an expectation that they should continue to work remotely. We are four or five months into the pandemic at this point. I think the expectation has already been established. So when it's time to bring them back, you will just have to be clear that yes, you will be able to do certain things remotely. But now that danger is lifted, now that we are managing this, we have an expectation that you are back at work. And you'll just have to be very firm about that. They will ask why. And there are certain things that are much more effective face to face. And you will just have to point to those things, whether it's training your colleagues, learning new skills, um, or just the physical tasks that have to occur. Or spelling the other workers who have been working in place so that the burden isn't on them all the time. Um, what do you do if you believe staff working from home do not have enough work to match their 40 hour work week? Again, I require them to complete logs. So they're saying I did this from this time. If you think they are maybe working a little bit slower to fill that time, assign them more tasks, send them emails saying I expect this to be done, give them a due date. So you are Manage, manage them a little bit more hands-on, but that's okay. How do you work with staff about fairness of telework, who can do it and who can't? I focus on the job description and business need and saying well, you need to be there in person to accomplish these things. Other employees don't need to do that. So that this is just based on what we need to get done. And Tell them that those are the job duties that they signed up for, and they just will have to understand there is no way for them to work remotely. Um, I would also consider, are these exempt or non-exempt employees who are working remotely? Because employees who are non-exempt when they are working on site, that is also easier for them to be logging in and taking breaks and having that monitored as opposed to someone who has a little bit more latitude because they are an exempt professional. Uh, provision of equipment by the library for remote access. Um, I think I addressed that. Regarding internet, you can require them to have their own internet that is satisfactory. You can also consider, do you want to subsidize their internet? Can I require, I think I just answered that one. Easy timesheet software for those working remotely. 
I don't have that information, but I would check with your payroll provider. They should be able to point you in the direction for that. Returning to work amid COVID-19. Okay, the workplace. Let's consider the arrangement of your workplace and social distancing. We talked a little bit about that with, um, if you have carols, making certain carols not available, so you are de facto social distancing, making certain common work tables not available. Uh, flow of personnel and scheduling. You could, again, create a second shift for those things where people don't need to be facing with the public things like shelving, book repair, check-in, um, have employees split shifts. So they're only working half a shift at work and the second half of the shift, they're working remotely. And do your best so that the crossover between employees is consistent. The same people are working in the same area at the same time. That way you just have for lack of a better term, less cross-contamination. You have less, you'll have to do less work if you have to go through contact tracing because they will have only worked with a team of two or three people. Really think through business as usual. How are you going to have visitors check in? What protocols will you have for deliveries? Do deliveries, do you have to have a face-to-face -face drop off and sign off or can they just drop off the delivery and then you can bring it in, same with shipment. Do meetings really have to be in place? How are you going to audit um, social distancing? It is a good idea for a supervisor to do walkthroughs and make sure that employees are not um, sitting too close together, getting too close. Um, a lot of employers are just turning off their vending machines um, and shutting down their common break areas. That may not be feasible. What you can do instead is leave copious amounts of sanitizer around um, and sanitizing spray and wipes. So if you use the vending machine, put a note that they should be wiping it down afterwards. Um, common sense would say they should wipe it down before using it as well. We are a food meeting culture. Um, you should see the kind of ridiculous bakery that is deposited around my office when we aren't in a pandemic. But we've stopped allowing people to bring any food in. There are no bringing in of the donuts. We don't have lunch meetings anymore because any kind of shared food is a contamination option or not option, opportunity. Uh, smoking, again, smoking already needs to be at least 25 feet away from any um, entrance to any workplace. So make sure that you are monitoring this. OSHA guidance on preparing workplaces for COVID-19. OSHA has what we call the general duty clause. Employers must provide their employees with a workplace free from recognized hazards likely to cause death or serious physical harm. So we meet this by again, installing HEPA filters, high efficiency air filters, increase the ventilation rates, install physical barriers, and then again, alternating days and shifts. The things we've already talked about, those are also recommended by OSHA. If an infected employee is present within 48 hours of a positive test, have a deep clean done. Um, before you get to this point, make sure that you've contacted a vendor who can do that for you. If more than seven days have passed, cleaning and disinfection is unnecessary. Uh, make sure you do not forget electronics, phones, computers, any kind of um, input point, uh, time clocks, all should be disinfected, have cleaning trainings and policies, have mask training, have training because you will have more cleaning chemicals around, have training on the proper storage and use of those. Cleaning chemicals usually require that you also make available what are called material safety data sheets or MSDSs. So make sure that wherever you store your cleaning chemicals, you have downloaded the material safety data sheet from the OSHA website and keep it there. Bloodborne pathogen standards. OSHA would like all employers to have a bloodborne pathogen policy. Make sure you have one. The first 
for one of the first things they will ask you for if you get an OSHA inspection is that policy. Additional protective measures. Um, I want to make sure I get your questions. So I believe that we've pretty much talked about this. Um, do limit elevator office and conference room capacity. Um, close your shared break spaces. Stagger work times. Um, also close certain bathroom stalls that will create further distance. And don't allow carpooling to any events. Make sure that people drive themselves separately. These are a little bit more creative here, but I think they're a good idea. If you have a manual time clock, have one person clock employees in and out. Normally we say never do this because only employees should be clocking themselves in and out. Have someone who is the time clock monitor and they're the ones who are touching the cards and the machine. No shared equipment or phones, prop doors open. Um, so, no one, so you're eliminating high touch surfaces like doorknobs. If you can put up transparent barriers in customer service and collaborative areas, please do. Make sure you have a workplace contract, contact tracing plan in place before you have to actually use it. Testing. Testing must be accurate and reliable and also job related and business and consistent with business necessity. These are the requir requirements by the CDC and by the EEOC pursuant to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Key considerations would be uniformity. Who is being tested? What are your testing procedures? Um, what's the applicable threshold? What happens if there's a positive result? What do you do if someone refuses to be tested? Um, you send them home until they get tested. Um, how are you gonna document this? So who is gonna be tested? Anyone who is symptomatic should be tested. Anyone whose temperature is showing um, over 100 degrees should be tested. You should engage an outside testing agency who can do this for you. There are a lot of them out there. Um, it's big business right now. If there is a positive result, they should be quarantined for 14 days. You should require another negative test before they can return to work. Documentation options, you want to require results of any testing. This requires the employees to actually sign a waiver releasing those testing results to you. Insist on this. They can't say, oh, it's private information. Oh, it's HIPAA protected. It's probably not HIPAA protected. And yes, while it's private, they have privacy rights, but that they have to give those up in exchange for continued employment. So it's not an absolute right to privacy. You can't demand it, but they can't demand to come back to work. It's a trade-off. Um, testing questions. What's the best practice when an employee tests positive for COVID, especially if they have contact with all other staff and public? Have your contact tracing plan in place. Know everyone who an employee would have contact with. Have lists. Have lists of who someone's going to work with. Um, let the people who they've worked with know that an employee has tested positive. Do not tell them who, because that is private information that is protected by the ADA. You can't tell them who. Chances are they will find out anyway just through the grapevine, but that information cannot come from the employer. Um, they'll have to shut down the library or the area where they've worked until you've gone through a deep clean and offer testing to everyone they've worked with. Um, you do not, oh, moving on to the next question. If the library is listed as a site where a positive person has visited, what is the recommended protocol? We've been following the CDC recommendations for this uh, pretty closely. And they say that you should at least provide it, do an immediate deep clean at least monitor the temperature of all of your employees and watch for symptoms. For temperature monitoring, it's much easier than testing for COVID. Um, I would recommend getting everyone's temperature before they start a shift or at the start of a shift. This should be compensated time. So for your hourly employees, they should already be clocked in. Take their temperature. Keep a log of this. You are permitted to keep a log. 
but keep that log confidential. Um, and then tell everyone who worked on that shift when a member of the public who did show up and was positively diagnosed when they, if they were working then, let them know. So they know that they should be on guard, they should be alert, and they should be tested. What are best practices if an employee's family member tests positive? Um, tell the employee that they need to be quarantined until they get tested. If they can work remote during that time period, they should. Um, if they, and make it clear that they would be eligible for employee paid sick leave provided that they do get tested and that they do provide medical documentation of that. Is it legal to have employees log temperature upon arrival? Yes. Next question, can HR require you to take your temperature at home before leaving work? Yes, you can, but it's not as effective as doing it at work because that will, for your non-exempt employees, your hourly employees, that will actually start the work day. They're taking their temperature for your benefit. So as soon as they do that, then they get in the car, then they drive to work. That is all compensable time, so you need to pay them for that. It's easier if they come to work, they log in, you test them, and then you log their temperature because then you have more control over that information. How do we know when to require self-quarantine after travel? Uh, first of all, have a policy about this. Check if they've been traveling from a hotspot area. What was the purpose for the travel? Would it be a high, con high contact? Like if they were visiting a sick family member or going to a funeral, something where there will be a lot of people or a wedding. Um, is it intra or interstate? If it's intrastate, I wouldn't get as worried about it um, unless they're saying that they were going to something where it was an event where there wasn't a lot of social distancing. Um, if the staff has flown on a commercial flight, ought they quarantine for two weeks? I don't think that's really necessary, and I think the CDC would support that. The airlines are pretty good about keeping flights at low capacity and doing a deep clean between flights. Although I did just read today, Southwest is backing off on their deep clean, and it's not going to be as intense of a clean. I would be concerned about where they came in from. Have they come in from a hotspot state? Any suggestions for criteria used to determine if it's time to shut back down? Um, I would follow the CDC recommendations and the DHS recommendations and their guidance. And again, let your employees work remotely as much as possible. If I tell an employee to stay home while waiting for test results and the employee has no symptoms, am I responsible for their pay? Well, if it was doctored or doctor ordered, if there's medical certification of this, then yes, they are eligible for employee paid sick leave subject to that 10 day cap. If an employee is self isolating because they think they were exposed, should they use personal time off until they get tested? Yes, they can use PTO or they could, you could let them take unpaid leave. Um, either way is fine, depending on how your policies read. There's no reason that they can't get a test the same day. Same day testing is available most places. Um, and it's very easy to get doctor authorized same day testing if you do have adequate health insurance. Um, I would provide pay from the date of the test to the date of the result, but require them to provide medical certification to prove those dates so you're not overpaying. How do I handle a staff's questions about an employee who is out awaiting test results? I would give them no information whatsoever. That is not the other staff member's business, not about the identity. If an employee has tested positive, I would let them know that a, a coworker who is unidentified has tested positive that they had exposure to. But I know employees like to be persis persistent and they like business that is not necessarily theirs. So I would just tell them that we do like to honor the confidentiality and respect the privacy of all of our employees. Um, so I'm sure you would appreciate, appreciate that 
as well if you were in a similar situation. So to be quite frank, just being a little bit patronizing goes a long way in these situations. Um, and I know we are at five minutes now, so we are also allowed to go about maybe 10 minutes over. So I will do my best to hit all of the questions that you so kindly sent to us. Uh, what agency determines who needs quarantine when staff, when a staff member or family member tests positive? Um, that doesn't actually come from an agency. Usually it's a doctor will issue a quarantine order, but they are guided by the CDC, the DHS, and the Joint Commission on Healthcare. So those are all great resources to monitor on your own time as well. Managing furloughed and retained employees. Um, I think you would rather I hit your questions here. So I'm just gonna say, make sure you have contact with your furloughed employees while they're out. So you can keep them engaged because you want them to come back. Check in with them from time to time. Update them with library news so they do feel involved. Okay, more questions. How do you work with staff to manage fear in the workplace? Kind of a little bit of promo material, kind of managing optics again. Tell them all the steps that you are taking to provide a safe workplace. Um, talk about masking re requirements, that if you wear a mask, this is how it does affect transmission. And if everyone wears a mask, that greatly increases protection for everyone. Um, what can I say to reassure my staff when my boards are forcing us to be open? Well, make it clear again, all the steps you're taking. If remote work is available, let them work. know that there is gonna be remote work. If you are able to stagger their shifts, make sure that's an option. Um, if you can have some of them work night shifts when the public isn't coming in and you can adjust work hours, I would do that. When is it appropriate to walk back COVID-related accommodations for staff, such as accommodating them to keep off the desk? I have to be frank, not gonna be anytime soon. We're talking about a second wave hitting, um, especially in the Midwest. So um, it's not gonna be appropriate anytime soon. I would wait for CDC guidance on this. How do we appropriately address employees believing that they are working harder than others since work is still done remotely? I would be clear to, that those who are working remotely are doing, are working full days and are being compensated fairly and that you are monitoring productivity and time spent for everyone. But the nature of the people who are working in, in person, the nature of their position requires that and you can't apologize for that that is their job duty. And that, so there's just no two ways around that other than just letting them know you trust all of your employees to be working hard, whether they're remote or not. Is it okay to require three staff members to complete time cards while other two, the other two do not as they are at risk and will be paid full wages? Um, it depends if they're exempt or non-exempt. All non-exempt employees must provide an accounting of how they spend their day. Now, I've done this and done that, but I've been working from this time to that time. They must clock in, they must clock out. That is state and federal law. So this will depend on whether they are non-exempt or exempt. They need to be treated the same. So not different based on medical condition. How do we handle vacation days for staff who worked from home because they basically didn't take any vacation? And what do we do about carryover of vacation? This will depend if you have, say, a use it or lose it policy. Check in with your employees and monitor them. Make sure that they actually are working. Get daily reports of what they're done and require them that they must follow the PTO policy. So if they want to take a half day off, that they are taking PTO for that. If you want them to actually work not just eight hours in a day, but eight hours between nine and five, make it clear that it must occur during, during those time periods. So they're not just working from six to 10, then taking 10 to six off and working six till 10 and getting their eight hours in that way. If you need it work done during a certain time, that is the job. 
Uh, we paid our part-time staff. I'm sorry, I skipped a slide. Uh, how do we encourage staff to bring problems or policy suggestions to the director? That should be in your complaint procedure policy. Um, remind them in meetings, remind them in furlough communications that this is how you can contact the library director and you do want to hear their suggestions and their complaints and their concerns. So provide direct contact information. People need to be invited to actually take advantage of this. If an employee isn't able, able to carry out their provisions for their previous workload, is it possible to reduce their hours and pay them less? Yes, it is. Um, consider why though, consider is this a reasonable accommodation issue? If you are subject to a PPP loan, there are, there are certain restrictions on reducing hours below 75%, so keep that in mind. Is it legal to pay my staff when we are closed? Absolutely, you can do that. Um, I would, however, run employee paid sick leave concurrently. The thing about the FFCRA Act, the FMLA expansion and the EPSLA, they are entitled to that leave in addition to anything else you give them. So if they are entitled to EPSLA leave, even if you're already paying them for being off, they, are, they can double dip. So require them to burn their leave before you just pay them for being off, if they are eligible for that leave. So if it's someone who is taking time off for childcare, you can pay them that addition, th additional third, because they're only eligible for two thirds and just say you're going to supplement, but not pay them all they're off. Um, we paid our part-time staff their regular hourly rate when we were closed. Is this the right thing to do? What would be a better plan? I think we've addressed that. Um, I have one staff member that will never return, but is still being paid regular wages. Can I lay her off? Um, yes, you can. The question is, why and how are you documenting this? Has a staff member told you that they told you that they don't intend to return? If they've made that clear in writing, even better, then say, okay, then it's appropriate that we do terminate your employment at this time. Uh, what is the risk in hiring new employees now as we are short staffed? Um, well, after 30 days, they will have rights under the EPS, EPSLA and the Expansion Act. So You'll be hiring someone and then they could be taking paid leave off again. If you're fine with that, then that's fine. Um, consider pre-work testing. If you do a pre-work drug test or a medical test, how you will accomplish that. Or if you need to put that on hold, and this is, if you won't be able to have that testing performed till a certain time period into their work, then I would tell them that this is contingent even though you're working for us, this is still contingent on you completing those tests. Um, what other recourse does the director have when the municipal government does not file an unemployment account FEIN for the library? Talk to your HR and payroll about this first. Know how your system works. Maybe you actually are the same employer for purposes of unemployment insurance accounts. So you need to be on the same account. Um, it depends if they are the common paymaster and everyone is subject to the same rules. So that's something I would first talk to HR about because it's a very detail-oriented analysis. If you aren't satisfied with their answer, you can always call the Unemployment Insurance Division and ask them if it is appropriate that you are on a different UI account or not. Um, How can I get employees to effectively transition back to full-time hours after so much time off? That's gonna be a challenge for all employers. Um, don't plunge in, have them split shifts so that they ease back in. Don't say you've been off for four months, now you're going back 40 hours a week. That's gonna be really hard for people to readjust their expectations and their schedules. Um, talk to them about what they think might work for them. Just have open communication about them. Maybe they wanna start part-time maybe part-time in person, part-time um, remote. My final question was, what resources can I access as questions come up? Here's my shameless plug. 
um, Von Brees and my law firm does provide very rapid client alerts. You can sign up for them on this website, bonbreason.com forward slash legal dash news. And make sure you check the government, public sector and labor and employment and health tabs. And you should get news emailed. We are pretty good about turning around these alerts within a day or so of any new legislation. Um, right now, I'm going to, until everyone runs out of patience with me, I'm going to open up the questions that have come up during this presentation. Um, some of them I believe we have answered. Is the face shield okay? No, a face shield, oh, for someone asking for a medical exemption for, for a face covering. Well, you do still have to understand that a face shield is not, it's not adequate. Um, the CDC has been really clear, these don't do much. It may protect the person wearing the shield from a lot of particulate, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't do a lot to protect from holding back the, that person's germs and potential ability to infect people. Uh, let's see. Next one, we were having a discussion regarding whether a mask is required while alone in your office. Um, under the state law and under the Milwaukee ordinance, if I'm alone in my office, if my door is shut, I don't have to wear a mask. If I'm in a public, op public area, then I have to put the mask on. Uh, this person also has provided part of the Dane County ordinance, which states Yeah, the, I agree the Dane County Ordinance isn't very clear about that. I mean, according to the Dane County Ordinance, if you're alone in your office, it does seem like it does seem like you would have to wear the mask while alone in your office. Um, I'm surprised at that. I think that goes a little bit further than what DHS and um, the CDC requires. But there may also be other guidance out there, like an FAQ document or something else provided by the county, I haven't looked into this, um, that may clarify that. Any recommendations for counties where sheriff departments have gone on record saying that they will not enforce EMO1? Is library policy our best fallback? Um, library policy is great, yes. Um, this means that the sheriff's department won't come and the sheriff won't come, they won't come and issue um, any kind of ticket. You can still tell people to leave. They still do have to comply with what you tell them. Also, that's the sheriff. The sheriff controls things on a countywide basis. You likely do have municipal, a municipal police force. So maybe that's an option, whether it's the village police, the city police, or whatever your municipal form is. But also, if you do have a policy, if you have a board resolution, you can also point to that and say, I'm sorry, you have to leave or wear a mask. Uh, what can we do? You no, know, can we do one day per week as FMLA daycare versus 12 weeks nonstop? Um, the FMLA Expansion Act does allow you to do it intermittently. That's the employee's choice, though, not your choice. So if the employee wants to do it one day a week, that's fine. You can't tell them that they are only eligible for one day a week. They are entitled to take the full week period. But it is worth a discussion. Um, can the paid leave be taken more than once? Say they're quarantined once in October and once again in November. Um, paid leave can be taken to a maximum of 10 days under the Employee Paid Sick Leave Act. How would they break it up? It uh, doesn't matter. So if they use four days for that first leave and six days for the next, they're entitled to that total of 10 days. The Employee Paid Sick Leave Act and the, Employee, the FMLA Expansion Act, the Child Care Act, are only in play until December 31 of 2020. Whether that will be extended or not, who knows. But at this point, um, they will only have that available till December 31. For part-time employees who have COVID to receive the prorated 
pay, is there an amount of hours they need to have worked per week to receive this pay? What about age? High school students who also use for very part-time hours. Any employee who has worked for you for 30 days, regardless of the amount of hours they work for you, as long as they've been there for 30 days, they're entitled to the prorated amount. So the high school amount, high school employees also would be eligible. If an employee is laid off during COVID, are there requirements for rehiring the same person when the position is needed again? Um, that will depend on whether you have some kind of bargaining unit in place. So collective bargaining or any kind of seniority policy will, you will need to respect that. Um, otherwise, I think you need to do a careful evaluation of why you are making that decision. Um, whether there could be a potential discrimination claim, whether if they have made use of some kind of leave and there could be a retaliation claim. So I think that's something that you need to think through, talk about with your counsel. Um, if you don't have counsel, hey, give me a call. Um, another shameless plug. In terms of being consistent, is allowing telework for those who need to care for children but not for others an issue? Um, consistency is always key with managing any HR issue. There may not be a discrimination claim that comes out of this because having children on its own is not a protected class and having no children is not a protected class. However, managing morale, managing fairness, being able to say that you even handedly apply all of your neutral policies is very important. So I would still be consistent if you can provide telework you should do it. Um, if for no other work, then it's highly recommend, or no other reason, then it is highly recommended by the CDC and the DHS. Our municipality requires verification of exemption in regards to face covering. Is that legal? Further, what constitutes verification of that exemption beyond a doctor's note? Um, there's a difference under the mask order as it applies to someone using a public accommodation, so your library patients, patrons, I'm sorry, not patients, your patrons, and your employees. As far as the patrons go, anyone who comes into a public space, whether it's a library patient or a patron or someone going into the grocery store, they don't have to provide documentation that they are medically unable to wear a mask. So I'm not sure what the upshot of violating this municipal ordinance would be. Um, I'd have to see the municipal ordinance to know if there would be, if you can actually administer these in tandem. But my gut is that they're not going to be subject to the fine, the $200 fine under um, the emergency order. But again, I don't know what the ordinance says. Um, is it legal? It's always legal to provide a greater benefit under an ordinance or under a state law as opposed to a federal law. To be more restrictive, that's harder. So I'm not sure without saying it. Uh, what constitutes verification of that exemption beyond a doctor's note? A doctor's note is gonna be it. If you're saying something is medically true, you need a doctor or a healthcare provider's note. It doesn't have to be a doctor. It can be a PA, an LPN. It can even be a social worker in some circumstances. So that, that depends, but some kind of healthcare provider. I think we have addressed all of the online Q&A. So thank you for your time today. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, I believe my contact information is on the presentation or you can find me on the Von Brusen website. My name is Jeff. Trotier. Thank you.
Thank you. Our thanks to uh, Attorney Troder for sharing his knowledge with us. I'll be following up with all of the attendees uh, in an email um, and I will be sending you links to uh, the recording and slides, which will also be posted on the SUI Library's website, an evaluation form and um, the CE activity report form for library directors. With that, I will be stopping this um, recording and webinar and I hope all of you have a good rest of your week. Goodbye everyone. Thank you all.